Well, good morning. Welcome to our service this morning. I'm Bob. I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to have you with us. Uh, as we're working our way through August, I get the chance to unfold the word this morning. So we're going to pray and get to work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we set aside some time uh, just to gaze into the scripture. We ask that the Holy Spirit quicken our hearts, that you speak clearly to us. And that, Father, you give us the ability then to respond to you as we worship your name and we ponder what this means. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to be with you. It's been a fun summer. We've been in a series on the parables. And if you have your device or your Bible, you would want to get into the book of Mark. We're going to be in Mark chapter 4 this morning. And I get to do uh, the parable of Now, your Bible has a little title that says Parable of the Sower. I don't think the parable is about the sower. I think it's about the four soils. But we're going to be in Mark uh, verse 1. Let me talk a little bit, first and foremost, about the setting for our passage. Uh, Mark has been very, very clearly lining some things out. And so, in Mark chapter 1 to 3, he has established how authoritative Jesus is. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. Like, we see the baptism of Jesus with John the Baptist, and, and we see the Father saying, this is my son, you know, I'm, in whom I'm well pleased. We see the testing of Jesus out into the desert 40 days, the, the temptation that he faced, how he went through that. And then it moves directly into the calling of the disciples. As ministry starts, and his disciples start to follow him, we see Jesus quickly fulfilling the prophecies that were made about the promised one to come. We see miracles happening. We see power over the demonic. He casts a demon out. We see the power to forgive sins. You remember the story of the paralytic? They rip the roof off and lower him down. And he says, your sins have been forgiven. It's a little bit scandalous, but he shows he has authority in the spiritual realm. He's exhibited authority over the physical realm. He's healing and he's restoring and people are coming from all over the place to be healed. Mark also shows him establishing some authority by challenging the religious system of the day. We see Jesus healing on a Sabbath and getting called on it and they're calling him out and, and, and with, they say, you can't break these rules. And he says, you've got it all wrong. Uh, You have created traditions around things that God intended for your good. He's challenging oppressive regulations. And if you were someone of the day, this had to be music to your ears. There was no way that the rules upon rules upon rules that the Pharisees were imposing on you and the way they were doing things could be easily kept. It had to be an oppressive thing to think that I've got to, I, I'm responsible to keep myself clean. And I'm responsible to do all these things. And, and they've created all of these structures and systems just to keep me away from possibly getting close to the line. Jesus has been quite scandalous as uh, he's gone against the cultural norms. And you see him eating with tax collectors and sinners and hanging out with people whose reputation isn't quite so stellar. And the religious leaders are saying, hey, hey, you, you can't mix with the unclean. And he goes, no, no, I'm, I'm here for them. And then you see this weird way of building his ministry. It says as crowds are coming, he goes out to pray one morning and he comes back. And the account is that the disciples are like organizing things. And they say, okay, Jesus, there's, there's people coming from all over. They've traveled for a bit. It's early in the morning and... and, and you would think if you were building a movement, if you were building a ministry, if you were reaching out, you would go to where the most people are. And Jesus says, now nah, we're going to this town over here uh, because that's where the father sent me. I, I, I came for the sick. And he's not catering to the crowd. Mark 4 sees a shift in Jesus' public teaching. Uh, this is where the parables are introduced. And as the huge crowds come to hear and to experience, he begins then to teach a little bit differently. And he begins to use this this technique called the parable. And so we see that happening. Now, I love the setting of this in Mark 4. It's in two of the other Gospels. Um, It says a huge crowd is coming to the lake. And so for me... 
I like to sit and imagine, okay, who, who's in the crowd? Who's coming? So imagine this with me. You've got to travel somewhere and uh, you're going to see Jesus and to hear about this new teacher and hear what he has to say. There will be those who have heard the experiences of others. You've heard the buzz, right? There's all this excitement and, and, and in some ways they're just drawn to experience for, for themselves. Everywhere Jesus is showing up, I mean, they tore a roof off a house. He fought with the religious leaders. Like this is, this is pretty stellar stuff. This is really exciting. Who knows what's going to happen? We can't miss it. We've got to go. And so there's those who are intrigued and who desire to be part of the experience and not to miss out and, and they're coming to hear what Jesus has to say. There's another group of people that are coming. And I heard it described this way, so I'm going to relay it a little bit in my Bob language. Think about a shop owner. Uh, He works really hard. He's got a few employees. Things have been going pretty good. He's running his business, and he's been a part of the Jewish system for a long time. He's heard these accounts about Jesus, but he doesn't really dig crowds and he's, uh, he's not really doing too bad. I mean, he's making enough to care for his family. Things are going on. He's pretty busy. I'm not going to shut the shop down just to go hear a talk. He's got things to do. And so he kind of tunes out all this noise about this new rabbi, this new teacher and kind of goes, yeah, I don't know, as they talk about all the things that he's doing. Till the bell dings in his shop, and uh, as a customer leaves, he looks over and his heart sinks. It's one of his fellow men, but this guy's a traitor and a sellout. He's been a tax collector. What that means is he's partnered with the Romans to go uh, into these businesses and to these Jewish people and collect the tax, and then the Romans said, we're going to give you the authority to add a surcharge on that. Kind of like a, well, what would a a carbon tax? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) It was a joke. Come on. I thought it'd be funny. (laughs) But there's a surcharge that he can add, and they're not going to regulate it. In fact, they're going to give him the power to enforce it with the Roman guards. He comes up to the counter and the business owner kind of steals himself a little bit and looks at him and something looks different. The man says to him, I have have a couple stops to make this morning and you're my second one. So I've come to ask for your forgiveness. You've argued with me and you were right. I was taking advantage and I took food out of your kid's mouth. And I've met someone and it's changed me. And so I'm here to ask for your forgiveness. And then he puts a bag with coins on the counter. And I'm here to make restitution and make it right. And the shop owner's floored. This guy's whole life has been sideways. What's going on? He says, well, who is this that you've met? He says, it's Jesus. He's changed me completely. I follow him now. I see that shop owner. He wouldn't miss this talk for the world. Even in a crowd, he's elbowing his way to the front. He has to hear and has to experience this Jesus. Well, who else is in the crowd? The critics, right? The guys with their, today it would be their phones or they're there to write it down. They're there to listen to what's said and then go away and evaluate the message and see if it fit. They want to object. They want to trip Jesus up. So here's who's coming. Here's what's in the crowd. The excited, the the ones that just want to experience it. The ones who are deeply, deeply intrigued. Could this possibly be the Messiah we've been praying and waiting for? And the critics just waiting for him to make a misstep to say something wrong. And Jesus, for the first time, and this is the first recorded parable in all three Gospels, 
uh, gives this parable and he says in the middle of it, if you get this, this is the key to understanding all of the parables I'm going to tell you about the kingdom of heaven. Are you ready? Mark 4, verse 1. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him. So that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some of the seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on a rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up, increasing, and yielding thirtyfold, and sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears, let him hear. Ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. They may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? Now, I find that interesting because they just said, what was the parable about? But Jesus is like, you don't understand this? And he says, how then, how then will you understand all the parables? So here's the key, right? This is verse 13 where he's given them the key. If you can figure this out, all the rest of them are going to have impact and make sense and open your eyes to what I'm telling you about the kingdom. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then... When tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. All right. So here's what I did when I started into this. I tried to place myself uh, at the talk. And I think, you know... I hope I would have been a mixture of having encountered people whose lives were being changed and intrigued by the story. But I'm just going to tell you from the parable what my observations were and what I would have thought. I mean, the very first thing for me, my response on a first look is this. uh, Yeah, nobody's that careless a sower right? So I've got family that farms. I know what they spend on seed. I know how important it is. Everything's metered out. It's very expensive. What kind of a sower would just throw seed everywhere on every kind of ground? doesn't make sense to me, but I get what he's saying. The seed's going everywhere. Now, I understand the growth thing. This totally makes sense to me. Um, you know, that soil and the placement of seed matters, because 
my wife has a garden and we raise stuff and I've been around and I kind of know that birds will eat the seed on the hard ground and they look for it. And I've seen little weeds grow up right be between my garage door and my driveway. That happened to anybody else? And they kind of spring up and you're like, where did that come from? So you pick it and it, it picks pretty easy. There's no roots really there, but they spring up where you wouldn't expect. That makes sense to me. I get the thorns. We have a place in our grass where Canadian thistles coming in. And I blame my neighbor. Uh, he, if you know him, tell him. I blame him. Uh, but it, uh, there's no grass growing where the Canadian thistle is. Now nah, I get that. And so I understand that good placement and good soil brings a good re return. But uh, uh, he loses me at the crazy yield. I mean, his listeners would have felt the same way. Like, <laughs> you might get tenfold, but 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold? I mean, that's an exaggeration, right? That's crazy. And then for me, being there from my culture, this is countercultural to me, this idea, he who has ears, let him hear. Ears to hear, let him hear. You know, from where I come from, teachers want to package a lesson in a way that you're going to get it and understand it. And it seems like Jesus is going the opposite direction. It sounds kind of exclusionary, right? That uh, he'd be hiding the truth from certain people. For them, it would be part of the Shema. They would understand that phrase a little differently. But however you come at it, there's some kind of division that's happening here. That says some will get it and some won't. And it'll benefit some and it won't others. But that's my response at the first look. So the question makes incredible sense to me. The disciples and other followers are hanging around and they go, okay, <laughs> dude, what does this mean? You've switched it up on us. Now you're teaching in images we would be very, very familiar with and in, in pictures that we would relate to and understand. But what does it mean? And Jesus uh, has some interesting things to say. Three things I want to pick out. He talks about the secret of the kingdom of heaven. Now, in their world, secret would have been different than in our world. Because in our world, it's something that's, that you keep private. That's, you know, a mystery or a secret is, is something like a riddle you have to figure out. Something you chase down. They're just talking about um, something not previously known that's now known and revealed. Right? That you didn't know before, but now you do. One of the best illustrations of that was uh, one of the guys I was listening to or reading, I don't remember. He just told his congregation, he goes, uh, my middle name is. And so my middle name is Dean. Now, some of you didn't know that before. Now you know that. Uh, that was what was referred to as a kingdom secret. And he goes, for those of you who are seeking to understand, it's not going to be difficult God isn't out there trying to hide it necessarily, but for those with hard hearts and for those that would respond simply out of convenience and make a light decision, it's hidden. He talks about those on the outside. We want to make it an us and them thing. And uh, he's really just talking about those not seeking to hear and respond. Those critics that are coming to say, I'm going to evaluate and debate. Those people who are coming to say, does this line up with what I want or what I need? Is there something I can take from this? Or those coming to say, I need to encounter the living God who is doing something that demands a response from me. What it points to is your heart and your pursuit of things. And then the idea that it's exclusionary, that there will be a separation. That there will be those who encounter the information, who see it, but don't perceive it, who hear it and don't understand it. And he quotes Isaiah about a spiritually dull place where the nation wasn't responding to God. And that was their condition. And what it speaks to is the heart 
that this isn't a simple response. This is something you determine to look into, that you decide to hear and take in. And the four soils will show you that with all the parables, the soil of our heart matters. So Jesus says, this is the key to understanding all the parables. The sower sows the word. Now, there are some terrible sermons out there that talk about us being the sower. Uh, we're not. Let's just be truthful here. It's talking about God's truth, right? Truth from God sown for all. It's spread everywhere. Now, it is true that we're sometimes the agents of that, that we're part of his plan, that we participate with him, that we give it out. But this idea that we're the ones spreading the truth, no, we're just conveying the truth that we've encountered. And it says God's liberally show, sowing the truth about who he is and about what may be known about him everywhere. And it's the truth about what's really going on. How many of you ask this question when you watch the news or hear a report or you're online? Can I trust that? Is it true? That challenges my perspective. You know, they grew up in a whole system of how you do this, this worship thing and what God demands of you. And they had all of these things lined out. He says, the secret about the kingdom of God, what's really going on, what he's really doing, who he is, his love, his care, his plan, about life in the kingdom, how you would enter that kingdom, how you would begin that saving relationship, what it looks like to live there, what's coming in the future, and what it's going to look like eternally. That's the truth that's being sown. And so Jesus unpacks the four conditions of the heart. First, he talks about the path. Hard path. Most of you have seen this. There's no ability for that seed to go down into the soil or be covered up. It just lays there exposed. I've got some images in my mind about hard hearts. I got to sit on the stool because this is what I imagine about hard hearts. Uh, in the audience, there's the ultra-religious. They've already figured out and debated all of their theology and their understanding. They've determined what God needs to do as far as restoring them to a place of power in the world and how he's going to, you know, set up a throne and what he's going to do. And they have it all imagined. And so as they listen to Jesus, they're not listening. And God himself is there. I mean, he's fully God. And, and they're, the, the truth is just landing on a hard surface. There's no engagement, consideration. They're not even looking at all of the ways he's proving who he was as he fulfills prophecies. They're saying, does it fit what I've already determined? That's a hard heart. I also think about the ultra opposed. I don't know if they were in the crowd. Would you come in here if you were just totally against them? Would you fight the crowd? Maybe. Maybe. But those that aren't interested, I'm going my own way. I've got a plan for my life. Uh, <laughs> and what you're talking about doesn't sound like anything that interests me. And then there's the disinterested. The path where the seed lies. You come in. You might come to church because your family comes to church. You might be here because your wife makes you or it looks good or whatever but you're really not here to engage. You're not here to hear something from God or let it change your behavior, your life. It's just uh, what you do. And as you hear things that are challenging because you've hidden some stuff or hold on to some stuff, you're just not going to engage in it. I don't want it. I don't want it to change how I'm doing life. So I'm just not going to consider it. Man, it's really easy when you walk out of here for that to just, you're like someone who looked in a mirror and it's gone, that image. And Jesus says, Satan is just waiting to snatch that away. He doesn't want that to linger there. 
And so the hard-hearted, he said, the seed that lands on the path, they don't get it at all. The truth makes no difference. It just bounces off and it's gone. Talks about the rocky ground. We all know someone like this, that they've encountered some truth. They've been in an environment where they felt the presence of God and they're just overwhelmed. They received it with joy. It says it's just like, oh, this is fantastic. They absolutely love the feeling that they got and the benefits that are promised. And the, the idea of this is so freeing to encounter grace and to encounter love that way. And, and they just get a picture in their mind and they have great immediate growth. And we've all met this happening in people's lives. It's just an instant response that shoots up and then with it comes some expectations. Now, I point the fingers at some of the teaching or some of the things they were promised when they came to Christ sometimes. They had an expectation that health was guaranteed or wealth was guaranteed or my relational life was just going to fix itself or all the things that I desire, God just wants to give me, right? And when those expectations aren't coming through, what happens? They don't dive deeper into, well, what did, what did God promise? Who is he? Um, the Bible uses that term. They're not rooted, right? In themselves. And it's not a root in yourself, but it's, they haven't personally developed this relationship with God that goes down and they're at risk. That discipline to get into scripture and to plead with God and to mature. And it says that difficulties bring maturity in us, right? And so Jesus says, when tribulations come, when those trials hit your life, uh, could be sickness, right? Like, how could God let this happen to me? Could be difficulty in this world. You had a business, you thought you were doing everything right, and for whatever reason, it's gone sideways. This isn't what I was counting on. Jesus did say, in this life you will have trouble, but when tribulation, and he says, on account of me comes. So it means because you didn't cheat, or because you did it his way, or, yeah, you know, tribulation. Persecution. Jesse talked about this morning. Where it actually costs you to believe. The culture opposes your stance. Because the truth has come. It says if you don't have roots, if you're not grounded, <laughs> you're going to fall away. And we all know people who have just kind of gone, I didn't sign up for this. I'm not willing to do that. Then the thorny ground. I think this is one of the most common ones where we have all kinds of things growing in the garden of our hearts. Jesus, Anne, we have a flower box in our backyard, or a garden box. It's actually an old missile crate. They make great raised beds. Yeah, just by the way. And uh, we plant a whole bunch of different things and then we've tried different things with different things. This year, um, we planted too much leafy stuff by my cucumbers and it shaded out my cucumbers and my cucumbers didn't do well. I wasn't happy about it. But it's interesting how different pl plants get along and how they compete for the sunlight and, and what flourishes beside what, right? It says when you, the seed falls on thorny ground, there's often growth. It's planted in the life of the person. But there's no fruit. Because the stuff still in the heart doesn't allow fruit. It chokes out the truth. What is that stuff? Well, he says three things. The cares of this world. Huh. While we live in a physical world, we have some cares, right? There's anxiety. There's all this practical stuff going on. 
But when it becomes disordered in our life, when we don't root the cares of this world out of our garden in place of the truth that we're planning about Jesus, uh, it chokes, it takes over. Then he talks about the deceitfulness of riches. Uh, I don't want to just talk about money, but if you did a study through Scripture, Jesus taught a lot on money because he said this is a big deal. (laughs) Uh, It has the ability for you to place your security, uh, your control issues, your identity, like all of it. it, It's just a dangerous thing. And and if I'm in the wrong place in your life, you're going to begin to view it wrong and it's going to cause problems and steal fruit away. And the final one he lists as something to be pulled out of the garden, not to exist alongside there is the desires for other things. Man, we have desires, we have dreams, and they're not all wrong, but they become disordered. We don't say Jesus first. We don't hold on to the truth. If he says, I want to bless you, I want to give my kids good things, I want to do all this, we tend to kind of, well, okay, but he, he must want me to have this, he must want me to have this, he must... And those desires can overtake, right? And he says, the truth in this situation will bear no fruit in your life because it's choked out by these other things. You haven't done any weeding. And so it looks all leafy and big, but there's no fruit in it, just like our Brussels sprouts. Huge leaves, nothing. If anyone knows how to grow Brussels sprouts, let us know. And then he talks about the good soil. I gotta hurry up. The person that hears the truth, here's what he says about it. The good soil is someone that hears the truth, seeks to understand, has eyes to see and ears to hear. They wrestle with it. They say, well, this is about the kingdom of God. This is the way God is telling me about himself and his purposes and what's happening. I'm gonna wrestle with it. I'm gonna understand it. And then it says he hears the truth and he accepts the truth. God said it, and I'm going to adjust my worldview and my actions to what he's asking me to do. This is where we face that temptation that comes to all of us. To go about five or ten degrees off to adjust or distort or to make it a little more palatable. And it says the good soil denies that. It denies that in that temptation. And it says, I recognize it. I deny it. I'm going to accept what God said. And I'm going to allow it to shift my heart and my perspective and my behavior. And I said that in a very specific way because where your heart goes and what you see will affect what you do. And Jesus says, if you do this, it's going to bear fruit beyond your imagination. I've heard some say, well, oh, does that mean that all these people are going to come to Jesus? Probably not. Maybe. I think the fruit he's talking about is the fruit of the Spirit. Can you imagine a 30, 60, or 100-fold increase in these things in your life? Just think about this for a minute as I read the list. Love. Joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So against such things, there is no law. He says, if, if you tend the soil of your heart, and you allow this truth to come into a place where the weeds aren't choking out and it's not shallow, Uh, something amazing can happen. A 30, 60, 100-fold increase in the fruit of the Spirit in the life of the believer. Well, let's ask the big question. I got to get at her. So what? Yeah, there we go. Walk through the passage. So what do we do with that? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Number one, God is sowing truth. Okay, don't miss this. Here's what it says in Romans 1, 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. 
for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. When it talks about that seed being sown everywhere and and that secret, what previously was unknown is being made known, even through our natural order and world. And it says mankind is without excuse and that God is sowing on all kinds of soil throughout our world. God is sowing truth. It's out there. It's made known. It doesn't have to remain secret to you. But you've got to realize that you manage the soil of your heart. It's not predetermined. You don't come out with hard soil or good soil. Uh, You come out and you get to tend it. You have a capacity here. So you have to ask yourself these questions, right? Is there hardness in my heart? Am I open to the Holy Spirit challenging me, revealing something to me, convicting me? Am I so established in my worldview, my culture, my ideology that I am now just like they were then, not open to how God's moving and working? Am I missing it? You got to ask yourself this question, am I opposed to it? Have I just become so convinced that God's way will not bring me fulfillment and satisfaction that I'm going to brush it off? I'm going to allow those seeds to hit and I'm hardening my heart. And friends, can I just plead with you? The Bible says you can harden your heart to pursue what you desire, to to justify what you want. But it, it talks about the danger of hardening your heart because the truth keeps bouncing off and sooner or later... Um, it's really, really hard for God to break through in hardened hearts and for truth to impact us. We become hard. Don't forget this, a hard-packed thing is usually refer- usually found in a high traffic area, right? And so if there's a lot of people on the trail, think wide gate, narrow gate, (laughs) you'll find a lot of people to justify and to fulfill that. But just ask God to reveal, hey, is there hardness in my heart? Are there ways that truth can't be and that Satan's brushing it away? Is your heart rocky soil? You find yourself chasing a feeling, an encounter, an experience. Somehow wondering if you just wandered too far from God. You've had a history of responding quickly, but you haven't necessarily put down roots. I think of a hydroponic plant, like I've seen where they're growing all kinds of things and they feed water and and ultraviolet, like it's a highly controlled environment. Anything goes wrong in that, that plant is dead instantly. It's got no sustainability. My observation is if you're not learning to be in the word of God, feeding, spending time getting to know him personally, talking to him, if you avoid community, you're not in places where you're known and where people can speak truth into your life and encouragement, Uh, your heart can easily become rocky soil. And when the truth opposes your cultural values, when it confronts in a difficult way, the tendency is to turn away from the truth. And when the truth means this is going to cost, it's easier not to change. Is your heart thorny soil? Have you taken seriously the things that are identified that choke truth and prevent fruit? The cares of this world, the anxiety, our need for control, our focus on economies and governments, the deceit of riches, the role of money, who we think it belongs to, what it's for, 
where our security is or the desire for other things, the heart that says I need to take for myself because I need to experience it. I can't miss it. Don't forget the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't forget to have fruitful soil. You need to hear the truth. You need to accept it. You need to embrace the picture of life in the kingdom and how that changes your attitudes, actions, and behaviors. And you need to watch the promise of the fruit of the Holy Spirit absolutely abounding in your life. And then you know what's going to happen? You're going to have the courage of the tax collector. And people are going to see a change in you. And they're going to go, I have to meet this Jesus who's changed you. 